So welcome back. Uh, thank you for 2024. I'm Marianne Tillman again, director of the Center for Food and Resilience, CIFAR. Uh, and this is our Think Food 2024 11th conference. We're headed to our third session. Um, and we have three. This is uh, Food is Health is the overall theme. And today, uh, this panel is Healthy Bodies, correct application of nutrition to bodies. Uh, so we have three wonderful speakers. Unfortunately, Chule is not able to join us today. Emergency that came up uh, related to his many jobs. So we called to do that. So we hope to have him another time. But we do have Deb Phillips, who's here from the Southern Berkshire Rural Health Network, is also a nutrition manager. Uh, we have Joshua Fowler, who's from Just Roots, about Greenfield. And Steve Browning, who's right here at Barrington at uh, Hill of Life, who's excellent, excellent restaurant that I recommend you all visit. Uh, so we're going to get started with Deb uh, and thank you all for Um, so I'm Deb Phillips, as she said, I'm a nutritionist, and I also do community work. And what that has allowed me to do is really look at the intersection of food and community and agriculture and food and community and good health. And what, what I've really discovered is that what it takes to grow a healthy plant is not that different from what it takes to grow a healthy human being. And it's also not different what it from what it takes to grow a healthy community. And for me, the commonality has to do with the biomes. And I don't know how much you've heard about this this morning, but I'm going to just talk about it briefly. And that is a biome is, is called a distinct geographical region of a specific climate, with fake mild and light and all of that. And then the microbiome is always talked about a collection of microbes in our bodies. But the soil also has a microbiome. And it circles round and relates back to that distinct geographical region. And the longer you stay someplace, the more um, interesting, the more commonality those biomes begin to share, which is one of the real bases for, for eating local. Um, and this, this is just one of my favorite things I can't help but put it up. It's even the most powerful form of medicine or the shortest form of poison. We want it to be the most powerful form of medicine. Uh -huh. um, so, so while every single individual is different and communities differ and biomes differ and, and climates differ and all of that, there are some principles that I think are pretty universal. And I think everyone's probably familiar with it not on and this how and how to eat, which is really refer some to some of what Ashley was talking about, which is just sort of how how we relate to food, how we think about what we eat, um, how we savor what we eat, and, and and that relationship. Michael Pollan, of course, is eat food not too much, mostly mostly plants and not too much. Um, and then we may be less familiar with Daphne Miller, but she's a physician who's done some deep deep dives in pharmacology into um, that relationship that, that how a farm is like growing a human being. <laughs> and um, the jungle effect, which I really like, talks about our relationship to our ancestral way of eating. And we all have different ancestral ways of eating that we do need to think about for our own individual health. But the commonality, again, between our ancestral ways of eating is that it was real whole food that came from wherever they were living. And that's a really important piece and something to consider. And then we also need to consider our parents, where we were born, where we were raised, what that environment was like. And then we need to consider the environment we live in now. And so as we each think about individually how we nourish ourselves, all of those are factors that come into play. And as I said, the longer you stay in one place, the more in sync you come with, come with the biome of that place. And the more local food you eat, the, the faster that happens. But even simply walking barefoot in the grass in that place, walking in the woods in that place, all of those things have, have some unique markers that, that really affect how, how we relate to it. Um, so I always go back to what is food, and it may seem like a very obvious question, but the three things that I 
think about when I think about food is that food is information, food is nourishment, and food is pleasure. And I'm going to address those in reverse order. So food is pleasure. Food tastes good. Food brings back memories. It brings back associations. We use food to nourish, to nurture. I, food can also have some very negative connotations from, from yeah, emotional baggage that goes with it. But for the most part, food really is pleasure. And I don't want us to lose sight of that as we get into the clinical how we nourish ourselves. One of the things that really frightens me that I'll talk about a little bit at the end is that if we get too focused on how we have to eat all of the right things and only the right things we take away from we, we, we can easily lose the pleasure of food. So we really have to think about not just nourishment, we have to think about food as pleasure. And I just put this in because my father facetiously at every meal as my mother put food on the table would say, nutritious, delicious, and pleasing to the eye. Actually, he said it. Smack him sometimes when he said that. That was, it, it, it's a really nice way of thinking about food. Um, food is nourishment. None of this information is going to be surprising to anyone. Macronutrients are fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. They're primarily the source of energy, but they also nourish muscles, bones, and all the rest. Um, the micronutrients, which are your vitamins and minerals, support metabolism, structural integrity. Um, again, this is stuff we all learned in high school biology. I'm not going to go into the details, so I'm certainly happy to answer questions about that. Um, and the last piece of, of nourishment, but it also goes into actually food is information, but I'm not talking about that kind of information. The way food is information is that food tells your body what to do. And the food does that by getting its messages from the environment that it grows in. So food gets its, its messages from the microbiome and from the nutrients in the soil and then the soil environment, which I think you probably heard more about this morning than, than I could even tell you, but the quality of the soil, whether there are chemicals in it, what, what kinds of inputs it's had and what kinds of out things have been taken out of it over time. Um, you know, that's just a picture of beautiful, healthy soil. And when the soil below is not so great, you can always create good soil with, with raised beds. <laughs> um, but the other piece that, that people know less about is the phytochemicals in food, which is what I wanted to focus on because I thought this was the easiest information. Um, phytochemicals are, and I, I have a, um, this is, this is the chemical description of phytochemicals, but phytochemicals are associated with the colors in food. Phytonutrients were only discovered in the 1990s. They're, they're something we really didn't know about or understand until then. And there are probably 2,500 of them, and we may be studied 150 of them in depth. The ones that may be most familiar to you are things like resveratrol, which is supposed to keep your heart healthy, lutein, zeaxanthin, the ones that are associated with keeping your eyes healthy, but there are lots more of them. And I think for me, certainly identifying them, understanding their specific function may allow us to use them therapeutically. And I have to say that pharmaceutical companies are looking very closely at phytonutrients and trying to turn them into drugs because then they can make money from them. But if we think about eating foods of all different colors, you know, the, the rainbow, the thing that your mother said when you were growing up in elementary school, is really true and really, 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 really important because what phytonutrients do is that is they, they think about the communication that goes on between cells in your body. And, and some of the simplest things that I want to talk about is you put something sweet on your tongue. It sends a message through your body so that your body prepares to produce insulin so that when the glucose gets into your bloodstream, the insulin comes up to signal the cells to use that glucose. So what do you think happens when you put an artificial sweet on your tongue? Your body gears up to do that. And then there's, 
the job it needs to do is different. So when we start eating things that aren't food, we begin to really confuse the messaging in the mind. Um, the other really one that I love is that if you put something bitter on your tongue, we have bitter receptors, not just on our tongue, but through our entire digestive tract and on our liver. So that when you put something bitter on your tongue, it prepares your body to digest food. It says produce bile acids, bile salts, hydrochloric acid, digestive enzymes, produce those things that you're going to need as a food system. So food is information. Virtually every culture has aperitifs and digestifs, which are alcoholic beverages. But more important than them being alcoholic is that they're bitter. So you start the meal with something bitter and or you end the meal with something bitter, which helps your body learn to digest. Guido Massé, who's a wonderful herbalist, his company is Urban Moonshine Bitters. But he said one of the major reasons behind digestive problems in this country is we don't eat things that are bitter in this country. Everything is bland or sweet. And by taking out bitter, we impair the body's ability to digest. So it's just, that's how food is information. So food tells your body what to do. And I've just picked, and the, these are all just references that, that support it. But I've just picked three different kinds of phytonutrients to look at really briefly. They're the polyphenols. They're what make coffee and chocolate so good for you. Um, thank goodness we've discovered that. Um, but they're also associated with the red and purple vegetables and fruits. And the primary function of polyphenols is anti-inflammatory. We live in a very inflammatory environment. And these particular phytonutrients tell the body to quiet some of those reactions. We don't want to get rid of them completely. We want to modulate them. And these are the foods that do that. Phytosterols, which you can see are associated with the fattier um, uh, plant products. Those help us metabolize signals our body around the utilization of cholesterol. So they're heart disease preventive. And they do that through messaging about, yes, we need this, no, we don't need this. Now you need this now, this much or, or that much. And then the third category are the carotenoids, which are yellow, green, red, and orange. We always think of those in terms of vision. Their primary function is antioxidant. Oxidative stress is when particularly fatty membranes become vulnerable to oxygen and they get they, they rust, they get deteriorated, they break down. So cell membranes and mitochondrial membranes are really susceptible to oxidative stress. And when you consume food in carotenoids, and it's why it protects the eyes you are actually helping the body to combat that oxidative process and keep those membranes healthy. So it impacts, impacts cancers, inflammatory bowel diseases, inflammatory skin conditions, eye health, hormonal health, cardiovascular health. Food is information. And if we put the right foods in, then the body actually does what it's supposed to do. And we don't have to, to help it to do things what does this have to do with local agriculture? For me, it's all local. These are my gardens and these are my little friends. And we were just astounded when they started picking up the vegetables and we realized that the vegetables were almost as big as they were. Um, but what it has to do with local agriculture is that, you know, if, if all of our local agriculture was industrial agriculture, it wouldn't have anything to do with local agriculture. Because when we get to industrial agriculture, the soils don't have a microbiome. They, they don't have a natural balance of nutrients that, that coordinates with what's being grown in it. But we are so fortunate here in the Berkshires that, we, that our local agriculture is all sustainable, somewhere on that spectrum of sustainable, and there are lots of different ways to get it. But it, it really is all grown with sustainability in mind. And so what that means is that we're growing plants that are not being bred for transport and, um, and for, for lasting longer. We're growing plants that are consumed, that are, that are grown for, for flavor and nutrition. 
It also means that they're not transported, they're being eaten closer to when they're picked than, than food that comes from farther away. So those nutrients are, are more available from them. And it also means that we're building a connection to the soil. Every time you stick your hands in the dirt, you're renewing your biome. <laughs> um, every time you eat something from local dirt, you're doing that. And we also are creating a sense of stewardship which is also really important in terms of the continuation of being able to um, grow our own, our own food products. Um, that said, the controversies, there, there are lots of controversies, and I have to say that these are in no particular order. <laughs> <laughs> They're just the controversies, and we can have a discussion about them at the end. But can the world be fed without industrial agriculture, which really takes us to GMOs and how dangerous they are, and where that continuum from hybridization to genetic modification, and the reasons why we hybridize or genetically modify, and what that means for microbiomes and nutrient content and all of those pieces. Um, the questions about diet itself, is a vegan diet healthy? Um, and I'm going to quickly toss out an answer that says, for most of us, no. There are some people genetically who can make those conversions from the, um, the uh, essential fatty acids that show up in plants and convert them to EPA and DHA, but genetically, most of us are not designed to do that. Um, and again, can those genes be awakened by doing something for a long time? There's, there's a lot of controversy about that. Um, and that really goes to does raising beef and other animals contribute to environmental deterioration or is it really part of the natural cycle on farms of, of restoring nutrients back to the soil? Anyway, there are lots of questions and, and there aren't answers. One of the things I did want to say about the question about the world we fed without industrial agriculture is that there's a wonderful book called The Wizard and the Prophet, or Prophet the Wizard, I'm not going to play it goes, that looks at the Green Revolution and how it, the, the pull that came at the beginning of the Green Revolution between so, sort of the using science and engineering to increase the volume of food versus using more natural processes. It's a great discussion of that controversy. Um, and then lastly, should we be eating grains? What is causing our obesity epidemic and what should we do about it? What is ultra processed food? And I think that that's a really, there's, <laughs> when they started talking about ultra processed foods, they basically said everything from bread all the way to Skittles were all of the processed foods. And the truth is, bread is a processed food, but I'm not, you know, what you get from a bakery is not necessarily also processed. And we need to think about those definitions and what food actually is. And in, in my mind, ultra processed food is food that is made with things that you wouldn't put, have in your own kitchen. So it's made from things that really aren't food. And so once you get to ultra processed, you get away from food. Even a potato chip is food. Doesn't mean we should live on them, but it's not the same as eating a, a skin, for lack of a better word. And then the last one, I just I want to touch on this just for a minute, is what role does food play in health? And I have been thrilled that I was thrilled when medicine finally started saying, yes, food actually does affect you. Because it took us till 10 years ago to even start saying that, particularly in gastroenterology. But I I fear now, as I talked about in the beginning, that we're blaming everything on what we eat and that people are going on more and more restrictive diets, thinking that if I just do this and I just do this and I just do this, I'm going to get better. But if you're not connected to soil, if your relationships are challenging, if you're in highly stressful situations, and sometimes if you have some clinical diagnosis, food is not the answer, and a more and more restrictive diet only actually exacerbates problems that can create malnutrition. So I think we also have to think really carefully about what we do there. Challenges for me are fast food culture, 
low wages, limiting time, limiting people's ability to even prepare for the level of learning going through. Um, and then cost and the whole controversy around what we subsidize and what we do as a government. And I'm just going to end with solutions because I have to do that. And I apologize to all of the people who are not on this and very South County centric, and I haven't even got all of those. But the kinds of things that we can do is certainly advocacy for better farm policy. But we have donor gardens, we have people who are growing food to make sure that people who don't have resources have access to healthy food. We have organizations that are encouraging and making it possible for people to grow their own food. We have people who are working on gleaning and gathering crops at the end and turning them into things that food pantries can distribute during the winter. Um, and I said, I just, I pulled logos from the organizations that I could with apologies, as I said, to anyone whose logo is not here. And on, on that note, because I think it's always good to be. No. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'll invite you to enhance this presentation so I think you have more to say about local and access. Yes, well, that, uh, so. Oliver's getting this up and ready. I'm Joshua Fowler. I'm the program director at Just Greens. So we're a food access organization that is based in Greenville. It's a terrible far away from here. But uh, we serve, at this point, almost the entirety of the state of Massachusetts um, with nutrition and interventions alongside of our healthcare partners with uh, accountable care organizations. Uh, I uh, grew up across the hills, in the Hudson Valley, on a farm. And um, a lot of our neighbors who were dairy farmers in New York at the time went out of business. We, we watched them suffer. We watched their farm businesses become, unfortunately, less viable for a number of reasons that we're all familiar with. Um, the way the food subsidized, the movement of agriculture and uh, food processes um, into other states and across borders. Um, and, you know, this was a, a rusty part, the rust belt. And, yeah, thank you. Um, and we really watched the deterioration at the time of our local food system and of our ag agricultural sector. Now, um, food farming was really close to my heart. Um, I was a, a vegetable farmer. Uh, for years and years, for and um, I'm just constantly inspired by the way that farmers, small scale farmers, regenerative farmers, have come up and challenged um, the, the old means, old methods of farming, and really have created more viable systems um, economically, regeneratively. Um, to provide more robust and resilient food systems. So, get this up. Excuse me, this is where I'm talking about this. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about here. Um, just very briefly, um, I'm going to talk about who Just Rates is. Um, I'm going to talk about our food is medicine and how it works, what some of the results are for our patient participants. Um, what we're doing, the product itself, um, and then if you want to reach out to it, so, or give you some information about that. So um, we are at Chester City Greenfield, a farm. We started out um, as a community farm, and we grow an awful lot of food um, that we distribute. And we also are a health and social needs provider, and we work in conjunction with other agricultural organizations and food access organizations to get healthy local food directly into the hands of folks who are experiencing nutrition, um, nutrition security across time. Um, so, like I said, I started out as a community farm, um, really a community garden um, way back in the day. Um, we are dedicated to getting uh, fresh, local, regenerative food out to folks regardless of their income level, 
So we have a sliding scale CSA, and that's been a big part of what we do for the entirety of our time with just And so we noticed, well, I think we have the largest, if not, they were very damn close, but one of the largest snap on the world. Um, CSA in Massachusetts, and oh man, what's going on here? That's another conversation altogether we should talk about. But it's a big deal. We're giving access to folks that don't normally have access to this, this quality of uh, medical food, and uh, you know, we do it in a, a very open, respectful way. We have a sliding scale, some people, it's about a third of our membership locally is um, paying somewhere on a sliding scale. It's no questions asked, pay what you can. Uh, another third is paying what's not in there. And everybody else pays the, the full cost, the real cost that this is. So we noticed, especially with the folks that are really experiencing food insecurity, they with SNAP and HIP at the, you know, the lowest level of our CSA payment team, that over time there were positive health, um, physical, emotional, mental impacts by participating in the CSA. But even though we, we surveyed folks um, and we asked a lot of questions, we didn't have a whole lot of quantitative data from which we could prove that there were positive health impacts for participating in our CSA. So back in 2017, we started working with Dr. Seth Berkowitz. Um, and if you don't know Dr. Seth, Seth Berkowitz, um, he's an excellent writer and thinker in the food medicine world. He's currently at the University of North Carolina, and he just um, released a book called Equal Care. Just about how. What's it called? I'm sorry. Call Care. Can you talk a little louder? Is that possible? Oh my gosh, I absolutely can. I'm Thanks. sorry. Yeah, you please. And if, if I talk too loud, I did hear in high school. <laughs> so I can project by trying to spare me. Um, so yeah, Dr. Seth is, is really spectacular. What's that? Seth Berkowitz. He's at UNC. He wrote Equal Care, and, so, um, and he's just a, a really top writer and thinker in the food is medicine with men. And I know that not everybody likes the term food is medicine. The reason that I use food is medicine is it's because what that's what our healthcare partners are using. And it's also a lot about what's being written about academically. So we try to align with the people that we're working with um, in those sectors, but there's a lot of different, there's a lot of productive conversation to be had about how we refer to what we do here. So anyway, for between 2017 and 2019, we um, participated in a peer-reviewed study. And at the end of the day, our lowest income participants were eating more fruits and vegetables, a significant amount of them. They were feeling better physically, they were brought into community, they were feeling better emotionally and mentally. And this is, we've got data for all of this. Share that data with your own website. I, I give you that link later. Um, but with that quantitative data in hand, we were able to talk to healthcare. You know, it's hard to break into with just qualitative data, which is what we have as small land-based food access organizations. So we were able to go and say, hey, this is increasing the consumption of food, uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, which is gigantic. Um, so let me just... Um, we started working with Boston Children's Hospital in 2020. So that was through the 1115 waiver on Medicaid. That, that program called Flexible Services in Massachusetts takes funding, Medicaid funding, and uses it towards novel approaches towards preventative health care. And this is spectacular. We have healthcare partners that are now willing and able and recognizing that the quality of food and the availability of healthy food is impacting directly health outcomes. And that's lowering A1C. Um, it is increasing or improving cardiovascular health. And one of the other big ones 
is it's they, they have a lot of data at this point. They have that chart data. It is reducing the, the amount of times that people are going to urgent care. And so all of this, I don't want to do it because I want to see um, people have nutritional security, have enough, enough food and healthy food and the right kinds of food and for regenerative agriculture locally to be supported. And we have to recognize where we are this moment. It is also reducing the public cost of care. Now that is incredibly important because we can talk about that federally across the aisle. We can build, but putting our own egos aside, uh, we can, and I'm not trying to say that that is easy because this is very intimately going to harm the next four years an awful lot of people who are in our communities. But we have to build a coalition around that. And what that means is changing the way that we talk about some of the things that we do. And so one of the big things that we're focusing on is how can we show conservative folks in Washington that local food should be supported, that hunger interventions should be supported, and that if you do it in the right way, it's going to lower the cost, the bottom line of your budget. And we were just in DC. And uh, the, the staff, the staff need of the uh, Senate White Brothers. Was, was like, and we don't agree on almost any. But what she said to us um, at this you know, wholesome wave, food is medicine conference, was, listen, we're behind this. Our constituency is farmers. Our constituency wants to see their costs reduced. And so, show us quantitative data. And I'll ask again. But to you folks in the academic community, one thing we're hoping to, and I don't mean I'll make light of this, and I don't want to just gloss on it, but one of the things I think we really need to do is work in coalition and figure out strategically where we can do these studies where we can prove the impact and not assume that the folks that are ultimately going to make a decision here, whether or not it's fed. We have to show that the programs that we're doing are reducing costs. And I don't want to be grim. I'm doing a working hard to send a joy and to bring my own family and communities close. But we got a, a long road. So, we started opening Boston Children's Hospital. Um, over time, over the last five years, we started after that with Mass General Brigham, with Atrius Fallon, and then in 2025, we will be husband Um After that, we're, we're, we're now in 2025 with the transition to a health related social needs network. Um, we'll also be working with Berkshire Fallon, which I'm about and line as well as um, BMC, Boston Medical Center. So we are going to be covering really the entirety of the state. We're talking with folks in the islands, and we're also talking with some folks about southeastern Plymouth County because there's a couple of places that are hard to reach. But we're not going to do it ourselves, and we're certainly not doing this to enrich ourselves. We are not a for-profit for business. Um, and Just Roots exists so that we can support local farms and resilient local food systems. And really, the best people to do this work are the community-embedded organizations that know the population, that have the relationships with the farms, and that already are working with the populations to be served. So I probably went on the side of having this for a last minute. Um, to that I have a great slide. Um, we, we work with world farmers. Oh my gosh, they're inspiring. They are a coalition in Lancaster of about 150 farmers from across the world. And they're a business incubator. They help share equipment. 
Um, they help secure markets and they help to get people ready to grow in this climate. Amazing farmers who just need a little bit of support to get up off the ground. We've been working with them for years to come to central Massachusetts. In 2025, we're going to be working with Nourishing the North Shore, an amazing food access organization that's hyper local and sustainable tape in Barnesville County does the same. And Fresh Food Generation that's sort of climbs through the coast and, and does does Cambridge and Boston, the major metro area. We're really excited. They have a lot of great relationships with, uh, with farms, uh, and it is a very local centric organization. And we dearly hope to be working with Berkshire Grown um, and Berkshire Bound in the near future. Those conversations are incoming. Um, but the idea is we, you know, we don't want to duplicate replicate any good work that's being done, but we want to support the folks that are already out here doing it. Because honestly, we can't do this in that way. We know it's, you know, we, we, it has never been more important to build coalition. It has never been more important to amplify our voices because I'll tell you what, now that food is medicine is more than just an increment, but like a, you know, the us lefties like shouting that this should happen, but it's actually federally supported programming. There is big fish in the water. There is Instacart and Walmart are in the food of medicine here. And Dollar General is trying to figure out how to do it. And I understand there are food apartheid is real in some places. Dollar General is the only place you can buy food. But all we do is doorstep delivery. So we're great at getting people who are rural and hard to reach served with local food. Not that we don't do urban interventions because we absolutely do. We thought at the beginning of this program that people were going to go to the pediatricians and have like that market style, like, you know, come and destigmatize going to the doctor and pick up your food here. But then lockdown hit immediately, and we started doing door to door delivery and we would go. And once things started to start creeping out of lockdown, and people started re entering the world after COVID, uh, we asked, you know, because we're, we're good, we have a good feedback loop, and constantly we'll find our program based on participant feedback. We said, hey, do you want to come to a market style? Um, pick up at your pediatrician's office, and people said, hell no, we don't. We don't have the transportation. We don't have the time. Our kids won't let us do it. Um, and we would really prefer that we could just keep putting the food to the back. That's what we do. That's what we do. And you know, we deliver fresh local produce, hyper-local, um, lean, locally sourced, sustainable proteins, fish caught in the bay, of course, we make accommodations for halal and kosher and vegetarian and vegan. And, you know, to boot, we do an awful lot, an awful lot of support. People get cookware, well, most of our patients will get cookware. Because we want to make sure that everybody has everything they need to process raw ingredients. And I'll tell you what, it is often the case that we'll get any patient who just moved somewhere after a fire or getting evicted, they don't have to anything. And so we want to do it. And they get recipes for it if they need it. Some folks come in as great folks and just need produce. But every box has a QR on it, and I'll share a QR on it. Um, and that's going to have pictures of the ingredients, some recipe ideas, and then we do also do um, online cooking support, cooking classes, workshops, where we just get together and play something. And uh, it's worked out pretty well. On call support, Spanish and English, we love to grow into doing more. We love to have a real sweet ground on staff, but we're growing as we can. Um, and uh, yeah, last last year we put a million dollars back into the local food infrastructure. I'm going to that. There's an awful lot of people that can be served. I think that 2025 is likely to be a really year for mass, mass health and 11, 15, whatever. But um, there are hundreds of thousands of people that are potentially eligible 
though this sort of food is medicine, really just healthy food intervention. And the recognition is that, like, hey, if you give people access to this food, their health outcomes are going to increase because they're going to eat it. And it's particularly powerful for pediatric patients. Because if you can get in early, then you know you can reroute some of the, the habits of really survival shopping for food. We know that bad food. The bad food. Unhealthy food, the food that's not the pinnacle of health, in moderation can still be fine. And we just want to make sure that people have access to foods they really can uh, you know, what we're doing. And I will say also, working with farmers from across the world, we also have the opportunity to, to put, in our, put in our boxes um, culturally appropriate crops that are important to the communities that we serve. And recipes that go along with it. So it's all part of the equation. Um, this is uh, some pictures. I have a bunch of fun. I got my mouth. Come on. Um, so it's, I mean, it's basically the CSA. Uh, we started with CSA, it's basically still CSA. Uh, it is local seasonal veggies. We do some, you know, low processing, locally produced food like uh, kimchi or uh, canned tomatoes. We do some locally processed frozen stuff in the winter. Um, and uh, these are some of the proteins. A full kitchen set. And unfortunately, the budget's still impacted because every budget's um, getting pinched this year. So it looks like our cooking kit is going to be a little smaller than this. But um, you know, we're, we're working with what we have. And we want to make sure that people have the tools that they need you know, to process a whole and to, to go through it. Um, and take a raw squash. You know, occasionally we put in frozen processed squash as well. People do better with, with the whole squash because the, the processed squash is the last place long. But you know, I, I will say this you look at these ingredients. What I would like to say here in full recognition that we want to keep local food nutrition interventions available for, for the palate to be prescribed. There are some people who don't have, um, they have space. They might be in an SRO, or you know, they might not have a kitchen to prepare, or they might not have the ability, they might have some mobility impairment, or other inability to prepare a healthy meal. Uh, meal. And for them, this might not be the appropriate intervention. But we, we know that this works from all the Here's what some people say about it. Uh, we work hard to make sure that people have very high quality food and that we're available to work through any issues that folks may have with programs. The other day, we got a call from Kirkwood and arrived at one of the patients of the surgery. He told us she cried. It was, makes me think. We have decent data, but we need more. Uh, the impact of we but what, what we are in dire need of is, again, our connections, our colleagues that want to see local food supported come in and do peer reviewed research to make sure that we have quantitative data to show at the federal and state level. It's important. We're spending an awful lot of money on preventative or preventable um, healthcare issues. Although we lose a lot of people, lose a lot of work. Um, and this is uh, there's a huge economic incentive to continue to provide food and medicine interventions that also support the food and This is us. If you click the QR, one of these goes out with every box. It's going to show you the vegetables and uh, some recipes. Um, that's me. I'm Dr. 
Come visit the farm too, it's really not that far from here. And it's far as well. Uh, and uh, they're very your And uh, yeah, please, you can, can we, we, I know we're gonna talk for a while, but we, we don't have enough time here today. And I can't wait for the questions now, section. But I wanna build coalition with you all. We have, we may be in adjacent sectors, but over the next, in the future, we're gonna to need to work together to make all this happen, to support local farmers, to support people's health, and to make sure that food access happens, it has never been, I don't wanna speak in, in definitive terms of that, but it's on us, it's on individuals, because I don't think that we can trust that this is gonna come down from the federal government or the next moment. So get connected, let's talk. Thank you, Joshua. And we have now stick running talking about chef chefing restaurants, food and that way. So changing gears a little bit, but it's all connected. It's all connected. And I have a slide, sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have you. Um yeah, so I feel connected to all this. Uh, I've been a professional, I've been a professional part of cooking uh, for sector since I was 15, 14. Started at McDonald's, worked at Jellies in New Jersey, worked at restaurants, went to culinary school, ended up working fine dining, you know, and then neighborhood restaurants, and mostly a uh, long time, what we call farm and table chef. Um, so, you know, for me, food is always good food is good food. Like, it's, I feel like, I, from a chef's perspective, getting good ingredients is just what you do. Or if, like, if you wanna make good food, it's what you need. So that's the primary focus of like how I, I think about food is like, that vegetable is better than that vegetable and I wanna make good food. So buy the better vegetable, you better need and all that stuff. So then the next part of that is, um, sure, it, it, that it's also healthier because, you know, all, all the reasons I've been presented and, uh, and just more, you know, whole foods are just better for you. And, you know, and I think, you know, treating smoothly and not doing too much of, to it is, uh, is going to uh, make it better as with the way I cook. So that, you know, usually makes it integrity of the food better. Et cetera, et cetera. So you're getting all the benefits out of it. Um, I love bitter. I love bitter greens. I love, uh, you know, just about everything. I've gone through every different section of, you know, being really into whole animal cooking, being really into vegetarian cooking, being really into, you know, different. You know, I'm very eclectic as a chef. I take from many different, um, you know, styles of cooking and stuff like that. But generally, in like kind of American, trained in French, and now I'm pretty eclectic. Um, so one thing about being a chef and food, I mean, is, you know, we work in these sustainable restaurants and they call the sustainable food. And, um, it's not always that sustainable for the people making the food. Uh, so that's kind of a big thing of what I'm doing now is, or trying to do now in my own little way is like help solve these things for myself and for the people that I like that work for me. Um, so yeah, it's like, uh, we've proved that we can buy all this food from farms and we can make it and we can do all these things with it. And then, you know, after a 70, 80 hour work week, you know, it's not that sustainable or healthy for your body. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, so yeah, that's kind of one part where I come from. And then, um, uh, you know, I'm, yeah, they're not always sustainable employees. And then, you know, my area is, you know, for healthy bodies, restaurants aren't always the best place to, uh, you know, be healthy, you know, lots of drinking, lots of, you know, you know, eating out at late at night and stuff like that. So, um, you know, that, that goes with that. So, um, so long story short, um, I've had some digestion issues, probably like 44 now, so when I was like 38, I think I had some digestion issues and then, it kind of led me more towards like eat like 
myself being more healthy and um and i hope and uh so through that i used food as medicine i went to the doctor you know they said uh, okay yeah you know you have this issue um you know we'll see what happens we might have to like cut out some of your intestine or you know or you know but i don't know we'll, we'll see what happens you know I'm like, okay that sounds kind of extreme um and then uh you know, in the meantime, just eat like Wonder Bread, American cheese, potatoes, rice, you know, and I was like, doesn't seem right to me, you know? So I like went to work and I'm like eating like what they told me. I'm like kind of like, then someone's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know what the doctor's going to eat. I don't know what's going on, you know? Like, you can't do that. So we started like making our own diet for myself that's like, you know, leaned into more like macrobiotic and Ayurvedic. Uh, practices and I was like okay cool so like long story short I was doing that and I just changed the way I eat and then um and then I just felt better and I well, slowly just kind of cured the problem I had and didn't really have to go see doctors anymore and and that was major for me and I, you know lots of other benefits came with that you know whether it be on a more anti-inflammatory diet you know not feeling seasonal allergies as much and all you know all these things you know um you cut out some things, your body takes care of itself, you can take care of the other things more. Um, so then that kind of translated to what I was cooking more, because I was like, there's a point where I was like, oh, maybe I'm just like a macrobiotic chef now. Like, how can I cook like all this food? I don't relate to this at all anymore, you know? Um, I'm eating like sweet potatoes and these things and, and I'm making all this other food and I just didn't relate to that as a chef anymore. So, as I was working at the kind of a more, you know, kind of farm to table, fine niche dining job, I started a side business where I was making golden milk base um, because that's what I was drinking at night and that's what was chilling me out at night. And um, and I was like, wow, there's no good versions of that anywhere. And anywhere I went, I'd be bummed out. So I started this making golden milk and that's where the milk and fly foods comes from. Um, it basically is simply is named after a skateboard trick. Um, I can go deeper into like that means more, but you know, um, it can really, what's great about the name is it can, you know, kind of mean whatever I want to not follow the rules of, you know, at the time. Um, so I was making golden milk and I was working and trying to get that on shelves, which was really hard. And then, you know, because it wasn't quite shelf stable, I was um, having to like be like, Oh, you gotta put this in it. And it just started to change the integrity of what the actual product I want to do was. And this is like a side hustle. And then I stopped working into my chef job and you could really burn out. And I was just trying to focus on this. And I had a hard time finding access to like kitchens to make my things at. And I had this idea to make a community kitchen so I could have a place to cook and offer it to other people. And then as I started getting into business plans and stuff, I kind of turned more into me not being burnt out, opening a restaurant that was uh more going for a restaurant and just a place where I could do all the things um, that I wanted to do. And I still make the golden milk. And I kind of have, since April, more been a full on restaurant owner. Um, and uh, my body has taken a dip in being healthy from that. Um, so it's good. Um, but so as far as for how that relates, to me, um, healthily running a business, um, I, you know, I Sunder, Sunder, yeah, was saying, what, what's your dream? And I said to the person I was talking to, my dream is to have a restaurant where people who cook can make money and, and do it for a living and not have to, you know, make, you know, low wages because they love what they do while other people make great wages because they don't like what they do. Um, and, it's, and in this community and building communities, I'm trying to build my own community here and keep my community here. And that's huge for me because I, no one can stay in the industry. Like you have a sous chef and they have a kid and then all of a sudden they're like, I need to be an electrician now. I'm sorry, I love this, but I can't do it anymore. Okay, I get it, you know. Um, so we want people to continue cooking. We need to figure out a way that they can make a living at doing it for the rest of their life. Whether and not becoming like a chef and then having to like force exploitation and all that stuff. So my main priority was to create a place where um, creatives could cook and you know and be creative. 
and make money um, doing it. So I had to lean into a lot of things, being my experience with like utilization uh, to make this happen. And, you know, early in my career, we were, you know, farm table was seasonal menus, first day of spring, here's your menu until the summer, you know, then it turned into like, monthly menus and turn to weekly menus and turn to daily menus and kind of where I'm at now, it's like, it's just whatever we're doing, you know, and that's, that's the true way you work with farms and stuff. It's like, you know, they were talking about having, you know, fields of cilantro and scallions, you know, I can work, you know, cool, you know, it's like, you got to use what farmers have and stuff like that. And, um, and the true way to like really, you know, create food that, um, that, and menus that you can actually help the whole, situation with is not having like I need to have these things it's like you know for me I leave it in my bag of experience but like I change my menu every day and I just cook whatever we we want to cook and we're inspired to cook that day um and how we can utilize things you know it's this thing today is that thing tomorrow so that's huge for us and then also I you know uh you know haven't been like shown like the end of shift pictures of beer at the end of the night um, when I was 17 years old and all that stuff, you know, I just never wanted to perpetuate that. So I have an alcohol free restaurant, um, which is really good for our staff because we don't have to deal with people that drink, you know, and all the negative effects of that. And also it's a place where, you know, a lot of people I work with are sober and, you know, can, can work and not have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about working with people that are drinking on the job, which is, uh, you know, a problem that, in restaurants so that was huge so and i'm just trying to i was thinking of things for me it's like i don't drink why would i have a restaurant that had drinking just because i'd make money like kind of doesn't seem worth it to me um so i we have our own non alcoholic drink program um we're very veg heavy because that um that's how i like to cook and it helps with cost and keeping i want to be accessible to everybody so it helps me keep my menus cost lowish and um and I don't have to make up for percentages on the expense pieces of meat. I don't have to sell those. Everything kind of offsets itself, so I can kind of keep my menu as low as I would like to. Um, and I'm vegan accidentally a lot. I don't have a lot of meat. A lot of times people are surprised, you know, that you know, I don't have any meat. Um, I like to keep it accessible to everyone, low prices, good food. Um, so no alcohol. Uh, we took away the service part of it because I – I mean, traditionally, don't love having um, a service person be the base of my restaurant. I'd rather uh, the customer's experience be based on the experience that we create. And uh, also, I don't want my, um, and also, we don't do tipping. So we have no service and no tipping at my restaurant. And I don't want my employees to be, you know, paid by, you know, what the customer feels they should their work. I'm trying to invest in my employees. I'm not going to say a livable wage, you know, because I don't really know what a livable wage is, but I'm just trying to pay, like, most of my people, like, up to $10 more than they would get paid doing it anywhere else. And by not having service, we're kind of, you know, everybody gets paid equally in my restaurant. We do have counter people. We have kitchen people. But I'm trying to create that, take away that divide where we can just bring everybody kind of to the equal. So, you know, folks are making more than they generally would and you know and are happier and our employees are just happier they don't have to deal with the, as much entitlement from customers etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's also how you know it's more of a healthy body mentality workplace um so yeah i'm working on the work-life balance you know a lot of my people work four days a week um and i'm just trying to you know trying to lean into like what I see the next generation reality being, you know, um, and that seems to be one of them, you know, I just work six days a week. I, you know, but I'm like, I like to, so a short work day week for me is five days. So, you know, it's, you know, I'm, and I'm totally all for that. I understand, you know, work-life balance is super important and they're not going to create, uh, you know, amazing food with a lot of burnout people. Um, yeah, it's when I have a space, a healthy community, and a space for people. And, uh, and just I, I, I treat our restaurant like it's like a company or a band or something. Just like I just focus on my like little part I can do and what works best for us. And that's um, 
kind of are my goal is just do what feels right for me in my spot, what I can control, and then hope that can like maybe create some sort of um, something for other people to look towards and um, be like, oh, they're doing it. Because it, when we started doing this, it felt very uh, assuring to find other places that were kind of doing the same thing. Like, oh, they're not doing it either, you know, because it's, it's hard to go against, you know, the grain, but just because what is there is working doesn't mean it works or will be healthy for us. The industry in the future. That's kind of where I'm at. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I 100% agree that it's medicine and um, <laughs> and yeah, good food is good food. You can't um, you can't uh, fight that. About a lot. Thank you, but healthy body and healthy community. Yeah. Uh, so we do have time for questions and conversation. Thank you to our panelists again. And I think it's really important to understand uh, the role that chefs and restaurants play in this in this system that we all live in. So uh, I mean, it's not to go against the grain. You're going going against the grain in a different way. Try to bring in fresh food to work with farmers and consumers and, and give people what they want. Uh, and they do want it, and we show real benefits. And Deb's at the heart of it all too. We teach people what's what food can and does do for you. What what we need to focus on. So I'm sure you have questions, comments. You want to share? Yes, Margaret, please. Uh, I I just well, I don't really think of a particular place, but I want to do a special call out to you because not only are you really providing us with a space with delicious food that go to like four or five places. But it's it's become a really community space. I think every time I go, I want to meet somebody else, and it's always a different person. We can always talk about it. And it's what I do at fresh fresh country. You're going to go there, you're going to get food that's grown in the area, and you can see all kinds of different people, and you're not going to be feeling like cheap because I spent a hundred dollars on two dinners, like which is not stable in most of that. Right, and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Yeah, we just try to make a place that me and my wife want to go to once or twice a week. You know, yeah. that's to me, food is not like about like doing it once a month or, you know, good food should be able to, you know, like just be able to experience it often. And, and uh, like we do want to bear it because I'm like, oh, you know, I appreciate hearing that. That's contagious too. Yeah. It spreads the good. It's called No Comply Foods. No what? No Comply. No comply. Yes. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah. it's amazing. You should go. I have a question from our from Zoomland. What is one food you recommend we add to our diet if we could only add one? What would have the greatest impact? I I don't buy into the single superfood theory. Okay. Um, as I said, every every I, I think produce is a, a whole category of produce. I think that everyone needs to eat more produce than they actually do, but eating a broad spectrum of colors and flavors. You know, you have blueberries, you the side, you have the potatoes. None of them stands by themselves or say. Produce is the answer. Yeah, so the answer is broader than that. Okay, good. Thank you. Lee. Um, can any of you comment on the fact that we need a lot of spicy food? Um, different people respond to different things. Um, it can speed up metabolism. It um, some people tolerate and some people don't, and that really has a really genetic component to it. Um, it's it, it's in the spectrum of healthy and of worse food. Uh, I don't I don't know that like bitter it has anything specific like that. The question I didn't hear was hot, spicy food. Yes, please. I'm so enjoying my visit. I can get this because I made it here to the afternoon. But I wanted to say if, if there's a national effort being made to put this wonderful, just written all these organic foods into the incredible public school system, which is so highly impressive. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent, an excellent thing. Um, we're talking about two different pools of money just to, to get that straight. So the, the program that we're talking about here is uh, the Medicaid program. 
Massachusetts. Uh, mass health specifically. Just Roots, also locally, works is heavily invested with in these schools. Oh, um, yeah, it, but it's, it's tough because the problem, and this is writ large, is that LVU is more expensive. And it's more expensive if you don't exploit anyone. So, you know, it's, it's not the, you know, the doing this uh, cafeteria staff that, you know, are really like going in and like making sure that. They're, they're, they're trying to be as responsible as possible with a limited budget. So that, that's really a place where, yes, let's do it. And let's figure out a way that cooks and farmers, everybody touches it along the way, can get at their wage so that we can make sure that kids are being as healthy as possible. What about like a huge incentive? Like, what about a huge, huge billion dollar federal grant for the public school system for healthy food? Would that make sense? Yes, it would. Listen, if we can turn off 2% of the subsidy on corn and soy. Say again, I'm sorry. We can carve off 2% off the federal corn and soy subsidy. Go ahead. The Cheeto subsidy. The Cheeto subsidy. Back to the Cheeto subsidy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, um, um, uh, I'm a fundraiser for Farmsteads for Farmers, and so one of the important talking points I have, you know, or the problems that I come up come up against is talking about, our, um, you know, artisanal foods, you know, and the value of them when you're talking about people who are just really struggling to buy food in the market. And I can say, yes, all of, all of this food of the, the farmers that I'm supporting ends up in food pantries through, you know, Berkshire Adventures and Berkshire Grown Programs and all of that. Um, but so I'm wondering if anybody has developed, you know, sort of the, 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 the carbon cost, but not the carbon cost, but the unintended cost of the tries of chicken. So I can talk about the artisanal chicken or the artisanal head of lettuce and that, 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 Big Y chicken or head of lettuce and its actual cost, which includes environmental costs and health costs and um, and all of those things. And then, so I'm looking for that. Yeah. Is, is anybody working on that? <laughs> no. Good question. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really good question. I know you have access. I think there are, there are places that have touched on it. I can certainly look at some of them. I don't think anyone has done it comprehensively enough, but there it's very real. And, and the amount of money the federal government is paying people to grow food that's less healthy. Yeah. And I think that that's that's the other piece that we have to think about. So you've got the carbon cost and you've got the nutritional cost, but you also literally have the dollar cost of the, the federal government, which could be put into doing things differently. Which then leads to the health costs that you were talking about. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And one really interesting way to talk about this to, to some farmers is as a national security issue, and it makes me bananas to think about it that way, but <laughs> with, I love that. climate change being given us such an unpredictable weather pattern. Okay, so like we're, we're farmers. You know, three out of the past four years have been garbage for growing food, and we need to be able to be putting in infrastructure making sure that our farms are viable so that, you know, when there is a wild, disastrous weather event, then we can continue to support a population. I think that's never been more important. So I used to, um, I used to run an educational program in Alaska. We're um, right outside of Anchorage. And uh, we'd have a bad storm, and the grocery stores would empty out for two weeks. And and we are incredibly indebted to farmers in Mexico and Southern California for growing most of our food. And our soil here is awesome. And the growing season keeps on getting longer. So, so it's a national security issue. Well, I think Kohler also pointed that out to yes. us. When the supply chain stopped, the ability to have been, and fortunately we were coming into spring when it happened. But to really look at that and say, if that happens again, yes, it's nice to eat bananas and oranges and all kinds of other things, but, but what can we do to make sure that we're, we're okay, even if the supply chain does get broken up in that way again? So I think, I think we've already experienced it in 
on a smaller scale than than a large climate disaster. But I think it was a, for me anyway, it was a real wake up call to reinforce the fact that we need infrastructure to feed ourselves in the event that we actually need. The number would be great, but I think noting those elements when you're talking to funders is really important. All over the I also want to say that farm sites for farmers has a lot of interesting materials over here. You can look at this table as you go by. I recommend that you do so. Any any other questions before I come back to you? I'll say this. There is a there was a really tall green one scene uh garden that came back uh since developed a long time ago. I was really like twenty years ago. Um, and it was Carbon particularly paper. dominant in uh, Europe and England, okay. but it carried over and it, it just it became less interesting to people. Okay. To go through I think process. it's yeah, it's carbon. It's also these other things that we're talking about infrastructure health. Yeah. So yes, yeah, yeah. I really love where you talk about the micro fire. Yeah. People yeah. Uh, the soil. And I actually visited a farmer yesterday who is uh, is growing in soil, and because of a lot of these climate <laughs> catastrophes and, and becoming more difficult, we actually have a giant grant to, to get a shipping container and is growing hydroponically. In, in which, I mean, from a food security perspective, there's, that's that's really cool and interesting, but I really worry about the implications of, or or what do you think, I guess, my, is 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 that disconnection from the soil, like what do you think for that? I, I share your concern, as you know, particularly in urban areas, we're seeing a lot of hydroponics. And again, in terms of infrastructure and access, it's really important, and I, just recently saw a study that began to look at nutritional value of hydroponics versus soil grown and found that they were very similar. But my concern is when when they look at nutritional value, they look at vitamins and minerals. Right. And that's all they look at. It's why every time they compare organically grown food to industrially grown food, they find that the vitamin and mineral content are the same, but they're neglecting all of that. So I think, I don't know that the studies have been done yet, but I share your, I had the exact same reaction when they started, they started saying, well, in cities, we grow all of our own food, we do it hydroponically. I, so I don't know the answer to that, but I, I do share your concern with that. Yes. So I'm going to cut, cut us a tiny bit short because we're going to get started uh, setting up with uh, Mary Nessel, who's our keynote speaker. So I'm going to give you all a little bit of a break. Help yourself to coffee, tea. But thank you for these panelists.